So thank you for tuning in today for episode 40. And uh, without further ado, I'm going to bring on my pal, the one and only Jeremy Stacy. And there he is. How you doing, John? I'm great, Jeremy. Were you, were you listening to my my uh, was, rambling? Was. Yeah, Just okay. Making sure you didn't say anything, you know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. No. Let's, well, that's let's the, start off, you know. <laughs> <on a good foot. laughs> that's that's the nice thing about this is we can say whatever we want. You know, we can. Somebody yeah. asked me the other day, "Can we? Can I swear?" I said, "Shit, yeah, or yeah, you know, like." So, but we we try we try yeah. to keep it. Try to keep yeah, it. At, at a minimum. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'll <laughs> try. So, how are you, my friend? I'm good. I'm pre pretty good. I've uh, I've actually been. I've actually been fairly busy the past few weeks. Um, I, I can't, there's been a few th things going on that I can't really talk about with also trying to do a King Crimson tour starting middle of July, which is looking like it's going ahead. We may have to quarantine when we get out there. We don't know yet. Yeah. And uh, there's, there's like plan A, plan B, plan C, uh, <laughs> maybe going on to sort of uh, G or H, you know, it's, it's, yeah. a, it's an absolute nightmare for the management and tour manager to oh. try and uh, see what we can do, but we, we want to try and do it because, you know, I think, you know, we're every, well, there's an ob obvious age uh, issue in the band and, you know, people, I mean, even though everybody wants to tour, you know, it's just, it's getting to that point where we should, we probably should get out there and do it whenever we can. So yeah, I I was going to ask you because I'd heard something about it, and and then I I before we had our little um, sound test earlier, I went on to see if there are any dates, and it and they what I saw on the internet just said um, TBA, you know, to be announced or something, and and I was going to, but I'd heard from a pretty reliable source recently that it looked like you guys were going to go out. So that's interesting that you say that that it's yeah, it's it's, it's looking yeah. pretty, it's looking. I mean, way more likely than I ever would have, you know, if you'd asked me in February, February, I would have gone, yeah, I don't know how we're going to do this. But now, but now it's, it's, you know, especially since America seems to have opened up and gigs are, and most of our gigs are outside as well, which yeah, is, is good, except when you're playing Phoenix in August, might not be so good. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Outside. Yeah. That might, that might be, that might be quite interesting. Um, but, um, but we'll see. Um, yeah, I hope. Yeah, we obviously we all hope it happens. And uh, yeah, yeah, so. I hope so too. So I was that, just going to say too, and and you, you know, having seen the band a bunch of times, you guys all wear those nice fancy suits too when you play. So it's if it's Phoenix in August, you're done for. <laughs> I know we're going to have to have a word with the boss about uh, perhaps uh, short short sleeve shirts or something. <laughs> I don't quite know what we get. What we'll be allowed to? No, I mean we uh, we we take uh, us drummers take our jackets off, fortunately. So, so we we we'll be okay. Yeah. yeah, good. Well, man, I hope that happens. And I know there was a there was a um, a tentative date here in Boston at this outdoor venue right by the water. I don't know if you played there with Cheryl, maybe at one time. That I think I did. Yeah, there I was a, there's an, an outdoor venue by the water. Yeah, I remember it. Yeah, um, I don't remember the the name of the venue, but I remember. I remember going there. Well, what time is it? I'll, the, the name changes almost by the hour these days. It's now called the Leader Pavilion or something. But it's every time, it, you know, a bank sponsorship either sells it or changes its name. The name of the venue changes. You know, it's one of those things. But, yes. Yeah. Yeah, I can't. I I don't have the list in front of me, but um, <laughs> I'm not sure what it's called at the moment. Yeah. But you're. Um, well, you're not in Boston, are you? You're. Well, I'm I'm so, I'm south. I'm about uh, twenty five miles south of Boston. So. All right. Okay. Well. Yeah. Um, yeah. We should because actually, the, I noticed the picture that you you were using to advertise the thing, which is not it's not my greatest moment if, as as far as pictures, but it's a great picture because it's you, myself, and and Gavin and uh, Dave yeah. Maddox, and it's in Boston at the at the King Crimson show. That's right. I know, and you know, I I I feel terrible that I I. I cut those guys out. It was great that you and I happened to be standing side by side in the photo. And uh, I just, you know, let's face it. We don't really, Gavin, Dave Maddox, who really cares about those guys when 
when you're here right now. I, I, so. I could care less, but <laughs> <laughs> I expect, actually it's Gavin's birthday today, so he probably won't be watching. Oh, right. I should yeah, remember yeah, it's Gavin, that. It's Gavin's birthday, uh, uh, but, uh, but Dave might be on. So I, I hope I haven't lost a friend there. You know. <laughs> Or me, I know. I'll, he'll 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 send that. me a text and say I'm, you know, I'm Listen. watching you. Yeah. Oh man. So 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 you've been you haven't been traveling during this time. You've been in in no. the UK pretty much the whole time, right? Which is which is uh, it's been great. I mean, I, I have to say the the experience of the lockdown f for myself. You know, I you know I know it's been really tough for some people, but personally for me, it's been. A blessing because I, I realized I, I was pretty I was pretty burnt out yeah it's just been years of just from one thing to the next and the thing is when you're doing it you're loving it and you you're doing this and getting this together and and then even when I'd come home I'd be doing jazz gigs or trying to get things that, you know doing my own band and all, all sorts of things and when it stopped I, I realized that uh, uh, yeah I just I was absolutely burnt out and stopping yeah. was a great thing, but, uh, and not traveling has been a great thing because it's been, you know, pretty much 25 years of, of nonstop travel. Yeah. Yep. So, uh, yeah. I, I, I was going to say, I'll bet you, you know, like it's the amount of time you would spend in Los Angeles. I, we, you know, I, I always found fascinating that, that uh, you know, you know, I mean, it's it's a it's a huge recording industry still, you know, in terms of an industry. But uh, for someone who's based in the UK, I, I I think it's great that you would, you know, and you, whenever we would talk about it, I'd see pictures of you at Pro Drum Shop or something, and and uh, and you never, it, it was like, it the the distance from London to LA, which is about a, I don't know, about a twelve hour flight. It never seemed to phase you to just travel that far for work and uh, and I, I what I'm getting at is I'll, I'll bet it was a situation where you're like on adrenaline the whole time and then when you finally get to get home and stop that's when you like collapse right you just go yeah, absolutely oh. yeah yes no it was it was like that and 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 I think part of the reason you know I I had a I was in a band in the early 90s and we we came out um to have a a a, a mix a producer mixer the guy uh, the a guy's name was is is Jack Joseph Puig, who um, did the Jellyfish records. Yeah, yeah, okay. I, this yeah. is why I've had this connection with Jellyfish because I was in this band called the Lemon Trees, which was my move away from you know from my jazz roots because everything up to that point till the age of twenty seven had been jazz or fusion or mm. that mm -hmm. basic that sort of music. Pretty much, I I had played in bands and I'd played I had played rock music when I was young, but really my love was something else at that time. And then I had a turnaround, joined this band, uh, which was an offshoot of World Party. Um, I don't know if you know that band, World Party. Yeah, and, sure. Yeah. And I just suddenly discovered this whole new way of playing, which a lot of people would be how they started, like Ringo, yeah. Mitch yeah. Mitchell, John Bonham. That wasn't that wasn't you know I didn't know how to I didn't know anything about it I mean it's incredible but I got to that age and I hadn't really got a Beatles record which is just <laughs> to me now is amazing it yeah, is absolutely, yeah you know I had every Weather Report record every Miles Davis John Coltrane you know and and then every record with Steve Gadd on it you know all the CTI records I'd watched you know, Paul Simon at the Tower Theatre with Tony Levin, which is interesting because I ended yeah. up in the band with him. Um, that was that was my, you know, anything with Andy Newmark, anything with Jeff Beccaro, Harvey Mason, Billy Cobham. That was that was what I was 100 percent into. And then even Elvin, Tony, Philly Joe, Sam Woodyard, Sonny Payne. And then suddenly it was, you know, I, I suddenly got it. I suddenly got what the English rock thing was and thank goodness because I could never have I don't think I would have ever been able to understand something like the Cheryl Crow gig or playing Chris Robinson from the Black Crows if I hadn't really checked that stuff out 
Mm -hmm. um, and that was just by chance. It wasn't a decision. I saw it. I liked it. I went, okay, that's what I'm going to, I'm going to research this music. And then I ended up in Lemon Trees. We went to LA, Jack Joseph Puig, who was the Jellyfish producer, mixed our record. And I just was like, wow, I'm in this, I'm here. This is where all this other stuff that I'm into happens. Yeah. Um, and I just kept going back. And, and then after a while, I was involved in producing records. And again, I found that the LA studios were, were far superior to pretty much anywhere else in the world. And I think they still are, actually. Um, and then, of course, I ended up playing with Sheryl Crow. And then I was in America for 10 years on and not, you know, pretty much. Yeah, and, yeah. and in Chris Robinson's band for two years. So yeah. it, was, it was a lot of, I was just out, out there and meeting people and then studio sessions would happen. And, you know, it was a very lucky situation for me. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and having had that, you know, all that experience and all that time, you could see why it's been nice to not be doing that for a year. You know what I mean? It's you the that time will come back. We know that. But it's I, I can see why like, it's it would just feel good to be just home, you know, for for a period of time and not. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and that was the other thing is that home for me has always been London. But about three years ago, I bought a place out in the country, which I had, I'd spent 10 days in over a two year period because of the amount of time <laughs> off that I actually had, yeah. you know, and I, if I had time off, I'd be in London because I'd usually be doing something in the evening or a session, you know, in the week. So this was a weekend place to go and visit. And the first thing my girlfriend and I said was, should we, should we just get out of London? Because uh, we didn't know how long we were going to be locked down or so we just came down here and it's just been the best thing ever. I mean, I'm still, I'm still very lucky to have a, a, a small flat in London, but yeah. um, I have not um, any, I have no desire to be there uh, often anymore. So, yeah. Yeah. And so where, then, whereabouts, whereabouts is, is your place, Jeremy? It's um, it's a place called Westbury. It's, 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 um, in Wiltshire, it's not. It's like um, half an hour from Real World Studios. Um, Ethan Johns, who's my dear friend and also a great drummer, but somebody I've been working with for the last ten years um, in the studio, um, lives fifteen minutes away. Um, uh, Dave Smith, the drummer, lives, and Jason Rabello, my dear friend, the yeah. piano player, lives half an hour away. Um, uh, so it's it, there's a whole music, and in fact, Gary Husband was living down here for a while, but I think he's oh. I think he's up back in London. But uh, yeah, there's a it, there's a whole scene down here as well, and it's near Bristol. So there's that there's a whole scene there that's oh it's, that's great yeah yeah so it's great, and um, it's just it's just a more peaceful you know, yeah live it you know just living a normal life, and it's it's a it's a bit of a novelty but i love it i love it you know so yeah that's great i mean that's that's what you you know that's what you work for right i mean you as you say you still have a, a flat in london so you've got a place if you if you're working all day and you need to stay you know you can't come yeah. back that night or something and yeah which is great yeah and it's again yeah. i mean how um you know it's a very lucky position to be in um but uh, yeah that's it's worked out very well having this place down here so I just want to quickly read a comment from just looking at some of the comments that are floating in here from Bill Fleming, who said uh, sure. the recent Scott McKean with Jeremy is burning. Many. That's times. been a really fun record to do. We did well. We did some. Scott McKean actually plays um, he plays guitar with Tom Jones live, but he's a phenomenal blues funky yeah. guitar player, and we just ended up doing. We met. A few years back and ended up doing a few gigs and it was great went really well and we ended up doing a record which my brother produced and mixed and uh it's been a very good reaction to it it was really fun P uh, pino's son is on bass rocco um wow uh, yeah uh, yeah there's a whole it's a whole it's a great it's a great little uh great fun record that's very yes. nice of bill and i love the i love bill fleming by the way that's <laughs> a great guy <laughs> Oh, good. Good. You know, Bill. Good. Yeah. Well, Jeff hey, Bill, Watts. If you're there, 
Oh, Jeff Watts. Yeah. Oh, my Jeff goodness. Watts says, love you, brothers. Stay oh, safe. Man, man. I love how about that? that? My, I do too. My, my hero, you know. Yeah. One of the game changers for me. Uh, yeah. As far as uh, jazz drumming, that guy. I'm hey, Tane, if you're still watching, I don't know why I hadn't mentioned this before, but we, we've got to have you on this. Uh, in the hey, future. Hold on, John. No, this is my, this is my, my <laughs> <You're right>. this <laughs> is... <laughs> yeah, Jeremy, Sorry. I'm going to, I'm going to start hold chatting on. with whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> So anyway, Jeff, where are you, where are you? <laughs> uh, no. <laughs> please, please have him on the show, man. I'll be watching. I'll be watching. <laughs> oh man. So, so in, in your new place, are you, do you have, well, I, 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 I'd be remiss if I didn't mention, I'm trying to remember when it was, it might've been 10 years ago or, or around that time um, when oh, yes. came to your, to your old, to your old flat, your old place in London, your, it was your studio, but it was your, it was your place, right? It was. It was, yes. Well, I had, I had this, in, you know, I had this period of my life where I was, just obsessed with recording and it was the fault of Jack Joseph Puig the guy the jellyfish guy who was is the most insane collector of gear but I'd never walked into a control room and heard a drum sound like it yeah. and this guy was Bill he was Bill Schnee's assistant for 10 years so he'd done all the Barbara Streisand records and all wow. the big you know worked with every, every drummer I ever met you mentioned you know Jeff Beccaro Jim Keltner He'd work, he'd play, you know, work with them all. So it was just a great, um, a lot of questions for that guy. Yeah, and yeah. watching him work. And then my brother and I just got obsessed with the whole recording thing. And I ended up having studios. And I the, the one where we met was next to the 606 Jazz Club. Yes. yes. And, um, and again, I mean, I never really, it never took off for me as a producer or anything, but I'm so glad I did a lot of production, engineering, mixing, because it gives you another uh, point of view from the other side. You know, and one of the big, big things you really realize is when a drummer's just soloing, when you're trying to get a drum sound, you just want to kill them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I learned that one. I learned that one. Just like, uh, yeah. Can you, can you just play can you, yeah. can you just, just give me the kick drum so, just I can, so i can hear the sound please you know? yeah so i that was like okay i'm, I'm not going to do that one anymore so that was that was very good um That's funny. but yeah i that was great and i so remember you and paul and yeah i'm trying to remember who else was it came. brad did was it brad brad, brad yeah. baker yeah the the fateful day when i i i walked away i'm so sorry but uh it was a move i had to make yeah, no, I, I, you know, and I understood at the time, Jeremy, I, it, you know, and, and I'm, and, and here we are, you know, like years later, still friends and, yes. and, yeah. and yeah, of course. And, and, you know, I, and, and I, I remember you, you were, and I so appreciated as, as I, I know Tina did and everybody, you know, that you were genuinely like, um, you know, you, you, you felt it was something you had to do and, and you were not happy about it and you weren't comfortable and, and, uh, you know, but I, but I, I just remember at the time saying like, listen, you know, where it's people do things when they have, you know, everybody has a reason for doing things and it doesn't affect how we are. And I know, I remember years later at the London drum show, we got together at a pub and that's right. You know, yeah. I had a little, you know, toast and yeah. Um, yes, it was great. And I mean, as I say, it was nothing. I mean, I, I tried to stay loyal as long as I could. I mean, I didn't just go oh i like these other symbols i'm gonna leave i i really it just kept coming back and it kept coming back yeah. and i just kept going every time i'm going what are those symbols it's the same make that my ear was picking up on so i just it suddenly just became clear and it and i know it was the right it has worked out for me and it's, it was the right move you know i'm even though i still have a whole batch of great zildjian symbols that you know to this day is still up there as, right. as great symbols, but the the Istanbul, I, which I will mention their name, the Istanbul egg <laughs> worked, yeah. worked for me. Istanbul egg, yeah, yeah, yeah. Great. I mean, they're and great the symbols. Same. Yeah, they're great symbols, and the same with the yeah. Tama thing. You know, it was uh, you know, um, 
when I found it, it and, and I had to wait for Tama because I didn't like the uh, initial stuff I got, but once they brought out the Star range of drums, it's it's been yeah. they're phenomenal drums. There's yeah. very few, you know, companies for me. Um, that there are companies, but there are it's very there's very few that top that can top that particular from, from my taste. Yeah, that's a, that's a serious drum you know i remember when peter erskine probably around the same time made the move yep. to tama um exactly for that reason because of the star drums and and he he had told me about them because he had i think had played a prototype and you know and, and peter's you know I, I i don't doubt anything he says and when he's that knocked out by something he you know he was like no you don't he you you won't believe what these sound like you know and it's extraordinary. It's extraordinary, and they still and they still do it for me. It's not, yeah. you know, it's like I I go back to a, a you know, as you know I have many vintage kits, and I I'll go back to a you know I'll play an old Camco and go these are great, but then I'll play the timer and go these these are kind of they're keeping, yeah they, they can they can they can ride with that and 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 you know I mean they have they're a little bit more general, it's a more of a general thing, but there's something. Um, something about it that I, I've, I've almost found that I'm using Tama in the studio more than the vintage drums for the first time because I found a way with the tuning that I, it, you know, I dare, dare I say that I found my sound. It's not, I wouldn't go that far because I'm always changing my mind and changing it for the music, but there's definitely something going on for me at the moment with them as far as that's, that's great yeah it's that's great no it's a great thing after yeah. being so you know all over the yeah. all over the place <laughs> well you know i i remember and i want to talk about your collection and i think you've told me in in the in more recent times that you've kind of thinned out the herd so to speak very strange oh there you are i'm here yeah um what i think happened? we're still i don't know what happened that was that's, that's never so happened strange. before yeah, and I was, I was I, yeah, I, anyway, we're back. It's, I think we're back, and I think we might still be, I'm going to see if we're still, if we haven't lost the Facebook feed. It doesn't, it says that we haven't. That's so strange. Okay. And, you know, I ended up just using my phone internet. Instead oh. Of, so hang on one second, Jeremy, and everybody, if you're watching. Oh, yeah, it's um, the Zoom, yes, it seems to have. Are we, uh, are we still? Charlie Drayton says Blackout Friday. <laughs> <laughs> Are we back? Let's see. Let's see if people are. God, that was so strange. Is Charlie still there? I wonder. Wow. Yeah. Let's see. Um, still there, fellas. Richard Brooks says. Okay. Yes. Okay. Well, hi Charlie. Hi Richard hi, Brooke. Charlie. Yeah. Hi Richard Brook. Man, that was so weird. It's, I it's know. Good to know that we didn't lose the. Um, you know, there have been a lot of UFO sightings lately. Right. Well, we. I'm, I'm not far from Stonehenge, so you know it's. Uh, okay. Yeah, there's it's stuff all making going, sense there's now. Stuff going on. There's a you know we're right by the cemetery here, so you know. <laughs> it was so weird. That was so bizarre. I I'm just ah hello, mate. Charlie says. Ah. Uh, uh, hello, mate. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, I I I remember what I was going to say, and I'll and I'll just shut up after this. But I just remember, the the extents collection that you had of drums and cymbals like you said uh, did you have multiple camco kits or just one were there I have, a couple i have i and i haven't cut down by the way yet oh you haven't you still have all those i think since you've been there um it may have increased by quite a bit it it went i, I went through a period of yeah there's it's difficult to it's difficult to explain um <laughs> apart from you know unless you want to use the word hoarding or uh, um you don't have to explain to me jerry you know who you're talking to. Ins yeah insatiable appetite it's um i it's it's not about just having one gretch it's about having a certain you know it's like when i see a white gretch i see you know i i think of lenny white or i think of you know um i see the yellow Gretsch I think you know and it's it's very difficult to see one kit as a you know it's like I could have one Gretsch kit but it's very yeah. difficult because they all bring a, a different and it, and it's weird you you set up that kit I can't play like any any anybody but it's um 
it has it has an influence on the way that I I play. Um, I yeah. think, and it, I just like putting up different kits, and even on one record, it will be you know I'll have a whole pile of kits in the corner, just ready to go, and then suddenly I'm just like I'm bored with this kit, right? Next. Yeah. And, and most of the engineers that I get to work with are cool with it. Most of them, some, some aren't, but uh, yeah, I just want to change it as, uh, and I want to change it all the time. I, I actually want to change it more than I probably do. <laughs> it's fun. Well, let me, so when you, when you get called to do a session, do you, I figured you bring lots of symbols and probably lots of snare drums. Do you bring like a couple of different kits at times? Depending? I usually take about four kits. You do to a, to a yeah. session, uh, and when I say four, at least I mean I want at least four bass drums. Like I'll have a twenty-two inch with a hole. And it's interesting you were talking about the hole situation because yeah. I've got a theory about that actually, which is see what you think. Sorry to just start no, off. I, 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 I want to hear this. Jump in this... Talk. Yeah, well, no, this is great. It's the sound of the 70s back in the day, if you think about it, and even the late 60s, you know, with Ringo, was a single-headed bass drum with dampening in it. Yes. You see pictures of Steve. Steve's first kit, that Gretsch kit with the pearl fiberglass toms, that was a single-headed Gretsch bass drum. He didn't have a front head. Yeah. So that, and that was, that was, I'm talking about Steve Gadd here, sorry, I do use the first name like he's, I know him. <laughs> Well, but it, but, you do know him, yeah. But, you no, know, I know, but it's just um, anyway. So Steve Gabb was using the the single headed bass drum, and that that has a, obviously this great sound. But I think then when people were asked to use logos, they still wanted that sound. So if you have the big hole in the middle and dampen it, it's like having a single headed bass drum because the right. air's got loads of room to come out. And there's no tone from the front head if it's if it's dampened. You see, you actually see like Jeff Picaro with his the hole so big that it's actually cutting yeah. through the logo. <laughs> you can see it's a pearl that half the, the bottom of it's cut because he's obviously concerned more with the sound than, than the logo, but he's doing the job of showing the logo for the for the company. And that's what my thought was. And then later on everybody suddenly went, okay, well, we want actually a bit of ring from the bass drum now because that's become the more modern sound is to have plenty of attack and to have some, and I even do a thing now where I have a, a dead bass drum and I often have another bass drum in front that's just a reson resonator bass drum that's mic'd up to just so that I can, you know, if that mic's pushed forward, it can sound more like a ringy bass drum and that gets me out of trouble if ah. I know that I'm not gonna be able to move uh, the kit, you know, the kit to yeah. blew off and I can say, oh, on this one, let's get the attack out and have more of the the roundness of the kit. So you'll yeah. set a bass drum up in oh, front of the bass drum. Yeah, and I'll have, and and I'll have the head with the hole and the hole sets off that bass drum and that bass drum will be very ringy, no yeah. dampening at all. And it's just a quick way yeah. of, you know, and somebody's put, what's that about delay? What's that? What's that? Oh, good. I was going to, because I was wondering about the delay. He just said the delay's gone. That's great. No, I was going to say, I thought they were talking about the delay of the bass drum, because there is a delay. Obviously, the second bass drum is is later, but you can, you, with yeah. now the technology, you can you can move it back. And uh, But it's a great way of having the choice, because even having the ringy bass drum in front of the dead bass drum, it adds another tone, even if you don't bring that mic in very much. It just adds a little bit of length. Yeah. 3d anyway it's we'll go back to the uh the uh, when i turn up to a session i like to have like a 24 maybe double headed a 22 with a hole a 20 double headed and maybe then another you know maybe a 28 with calf head on or something wow because you yeah. just don't you just don't know you just don't know what you know and suddenly it's like okay this is a very simple thing with like a marching kind of bass drum so a 28 with a calf head's fantastic for that stuff. Absolutely, yeah. None of the yeah. other drums, the other drum, each, you know, 20's got a thing, 22's got a thing, 24's got a thing. And then the different makes of drums all have a thing. So, and that yeah. was the great thing about having the studio back in the day, you know, because people would come and ask me to do sessions there. 
And then I could go, right, well, we've got, you know, there's 40 bass drums upstairs to choose from, which is a little, it's also difficult having that amount. <laughs> no, but, but I, but I totally get your point that, that you, any can really any conceivable sound you, you would have at your disposal at that point, really. I yeah, mean, I'm so right? just I mean, as I say, this whole thing of, uh, you know, I always say because, of, you know, I didn't study music, I studied acting, you know, and I, you know, I see it as sometimes I listen to a track and go, they should hire, they should hire Stuart Copeland on this, but they're not going to hire him. So I'm, I'm going to kind of do a, a Copeland-esque type thing. In the, you know, in the back of my mind, I might think that if I haven't got, you know, a, an idea of my own, I might just think mm -hmm. something. I, again, I can't play like him, but it'll be in the back of my mind. And I might just chuck up a, a Tama Imperial Star or whatever to help push that along. Yeah. And yeah. whether that's right or wrong, that's what I do. And I steal from the, the best. And I can't, as I say, you can't steal. You can't be anything other than yourself. And I, I've stopped worrying about people saying you're copying or, I, I, you know, I'm not copying anybody. I'm just... I'm influenced by the great drummers that I love and wish I could play like. And you know, if I if I steal their their suit, you know, in other words, steal their <laughs> drum kit, then it just gives me it gives me uh, you know a, a it's a it's like you know adding certain flavors when you yeah you know, yeah. It's, you know, it's, I I it's think fun. that's I think that's well said, Jeremy. You know, I I, I think. Um, we all have, we've all, I, I think anyway, we've all been influenced by somebody or some persons, you know, whether it's one particular person was the, you know, the most influential or, or a hundred people. But, um, so of course, like you say, there's going to be some, some flavor of that might come out in your playing, like you say, but you know, you're, yep. it's, it's still you. I mean, I, you know, I, I've seen you play enough times to know that I, I, I would never, I, I couldn't, I couldn't think of one person and I'd say, oh, he's totally um, sounds like this guy. You know what I mean? I, yeah. I, yeah. Well, I used to get, it's weird. I used to, when I was doing Cheryl, I used to get a bonhomie that people used to mention bonhomie. That's because I had a beard. I had a green sparkle kit. But interestingly, as, love, as much as I love John Bonham, he was never somebody that I listened to. I listened to Phil Collins a lot when I was young, who's yeah. incredibly influenced. John Bonham um, and um, you know a number a number well BJ Wilson was another drummer that I really liked who's kind of Bonham-esque in a way uh, and mm -hmm. Keith Moon-esque in a way but um, again it, you know I'm I've you know if, if people say you sound like John Bonham I'll I'll take it it's like great thank yeah, you but, yeah. but it wasn't it wasn't a bit actually a big influence of mine you know uh, as as of course, he's an influence, but you, you know what I'm saying. He's not yeah, absolutely. at the forefront. It, it's not. Yeah, they someone like you say they might they, they they see the beard, they see the green sparkle drum set, and they go, oh, okay, you know, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> but, and then the bold hat, of course, which I was made to wear by you know, when I was with Noel Gallagher, he made me wear the bold hat, <laughs> and then and then that <laughs> stuck with uh, King Crimson. Basically, the only reason I wear the bowler hat is because Robert thinks I'm the scruffiest looking bastard on the planet. <laughs> he said, I hear you wear a bowler hat. And I went, yeah, I have done. He, I put it on. He went, that's it. That's it. That's it. Thank you. <laughs> and so uh, that's the reason for it. It's nothing, it's nothing to do with John Bonham. It's to do with the fact that I'm way too scruffy for him. So. Uh, that's, that's, that's a great bit of information. Well, I mean, it's a very, King Crimson's a very, you know, besides at another level musically, they're a very dapper looking band, very <laughs> debonair. I mean, Tony Levin up there in that, you know, in that suit and that slim physique of his, you know, it's oh, yeah. He's Tony's remarkable. the man. Yeah. Yeah. He is the man. So, I, but I want to just go back to your, your collection for a second, because, you know, it, it's a this would happen. <laughs> I know, I know. <laughs> I just don't, I don't want to move on too far, too fast, because I, I have other questions, but okay. I, I just yeah. want to tell you that, that, um, man, we're back. We're back. Are you, are you still on your phone? 
I went back to it. I tried to use the, it said that the internet connection in my house was restored. So I, I clicked on it because it's usually very good, but it just went crazy again. So I'm back on my phone now and, and I'm going to ask what? my wife to pay the internet bill. Enough of this yeah. messing around with these guys. So, uh, so um, is this the first, am I the first guy to have fallen off three times? Is this, is that, <laughs> yes. Is this, yes. Am I, so I, I am a disaster. I, I knew no, it. You're I, not. I, no. Jeremy, I think you can say, we can both say, okay. Jeremy Stacy has broken the internet. I'm okay. live from my drum room. <laughs> That's a great honor. We've I've, got the record, it's a re I've broken the record uh, at least. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, what I was going to say, is, yeah. and, and maybe it's the symbol gods that are stopping us, me from saying this, is at the Zildjian time... Gods are going, it's, let's get in. It's, it's, it's let's... Armin Zildjian reaching down <laughs> from heaven, <laughs> grabbing me by the throat. Um, so at, at the time okay. that, that I came to your studio, we came to your studio, and you showed us your, your drum collection and your cymbal collection, and I remember you were a little bit you know, not skittish, but you were like, well, you know, I've got these. I sometimes I need these Peisty 602s um, for certain recordings. And and I, I, I want you to know that at the time I totally understood and even and and now I understand even more because, you know, I'm not Jeremy Stacy by any any stretch of the imagination. But to your point about different drums, I love old Gretsch drums, but I find myself wanting to play my Rogers drum set. Sometimes I've got and there's Lots a Heyman. There's and a in Heyman. my Heyman kit, I just oh, got man. back. From, yeah, and, and it's in beautiful shape. And it really is a great sounding kit. It's amazing yeah. drums. Amazing drums. Yeah. yeah. Really great drums. And I've I play some non-Zildjian cymbals. I, you know, I know that kind of shocks people. And some, you know, it I think it I know that sounds ridiculous, but people are kind of like, what? That's but just in the interest of sound, um, sometimes I'll play a symbol that just has a sound that I'm looking for. And, you know, and, th and that's that. So my point is I, I totally at the time understood and I understand now. And I guess what I was going to ask you is what types of records did you find that you would use like a, an old vintage Peisty 602 or did you have some oh, giant oh, piece? Sorry. I understand now at Sorry, something came on. I just had to. No, that's okay. Yeah. yeah, I was just curious, like what what types of records you, you'd use some of those old vintage, whether they were Peisties or old Ks or or uh, even old A's, you know, vintage symbols that like. Well, again, when... it's this is what's strange about my whole thing up till the last few years is that, for instance, when I started working with Ethan, um, and that was actually when that was when I started to really have the problem was I, I did the record, Ethan Johns called me to do the Tom Jones Praise and Blame record. And well, he called me to try out and it was a very weird first day. It didn't, <clears throat> didn't go all to plan, but I had this, because I met Ethan at once and I knew he was Glenn's son and I'd seen him play in Los Angeles in Largo with John Bryan and all that crew. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I had this thing of, right, he's into Keltner, He's into Leave on Helm. He's into Ringo. He's into Charlie. It, it, and I, I could, I could hear it. And, and Bonham as well. I could hear it. I could see it. <clears throat> so when he called me, I thought he's not gonna want, uh, you know, I, I, this not to be taken. Modern. I'm not gonna yeah. turn up with a Yamaha kit, you know, with you know, stacked cymbals and a hi hat over here. Um, yeah. and, and three splashes or whatever. I'm going to turn up with a couple of symbols, and they're going to be old, you know, Ks. And uh, you know, and and I had an old Slingland uh, student kit, which looks like the Levon Helm kit, which I walked in with, and a, a Gretsch round badge. And immediately it was like, oh wow, I love the drums. And it's immediately you're helping, you're helping your cause by being, you, you know, you know what I'm saying. Just I totally do. Walking yeah. with the yeah. right, with the right stuff. <clears throat> and we did the record, started the record, and everybody's going, what are those symbols? I said, well, this is an old K, this is a old A. Oh, I'm using, there's a Peisty 602 here, but mainly it was old Ks and stuff. And and everybody was just going, wow, the symbols is making, because we were recording in a room together, like Tom was standing right next to me, 
with a with a vintage you know uh 44 dx44 rca ribbon mic you know and that was where most of the drum sound was actually coming through yeah. the vocal mic yeah. but his so his voice is so huge and loud it, and i had to play super quiet but that's how we got that sound um but now because so much of the istanbul uh, sorry yeah the istanbul agop stuff is so influenced by that stuff i find myself using for instance the scott mckeon record that i played on and also the new tom jones i played on a track where the symbols are really dark and trashy but it's all istanbul and they do and they do that job yeah, that was the yeah. thing i found with the 30th anniversary but also their turk range their their traditional jazz ride range and many many things but they also do a uh uh trying to think of the range but they sound a bit like peisty mm. so i've now got this way of if somebody said to me you can only have one company of symbols i could do it all with istanbul agop i'd still i'm still going to take a peisty 2002 60s because I want that Nick Mason sound, you yeah. know. And I mean, I'm not being funny, but you want that Nick Mason ride sound, Pink Floyd ride, which is classic to me. It yeah. has to be a 2002 20 inch. It just, uh, but the 60s ones, not the not the later ones. Yeah. The, the 60s I ones. I think I, I think I Nick one. Mason. I think he used the Giant Beats. He um, did use Giant Beats, but I but I did ask him. I actually said, he, I need yeah. to know what that ride is on. I think it was on. Uh, I can't remember which track I asked him, and he was like, 2002, 60s. And I went, yeah. yeah. It's, I, I, you can tell as soon as you play. It's, 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 it's such a, and it's not, it's not Formula 602. But then you get, you see, you get Bill Bruford, and it's Formula 602. And you yeah. can, I, yeah. I mean, I'm at the point where I can, I, I feel like I, I mean, I'm at the point sometimes where I feel like I can hear maybe what the mic pre's are being used like is it neve is it api because it has wow. a different speed it has a different speed you know because i had a studio and i had neve and api mic preamps <clears throat> and you i i sat and messed around a lot and just you can hear the speed the, the speed of the way the mic preamp reacts and the and the microphones you know like tube mics versus um uh, solid state and you know all all that all the differences you can you can start you start to hear a a difference with speed it's all it's kind of speeds one of the things yeah, yeah. I, I i didn't i i would have never like that's just so above my my but, pay grade <laughs> but, but, it, but it's but it's only because i've been in the fortunate position of of sitting in the room with that stuff that I yeah yeah you know, I didn't buy a, a place to live I bought all the studio gear for years and had nowhere to live so I stay in the studio <laughs> but um, <laughs> which was great fun but um, but through that I I I, I understood you know started to understand why you use these things why. And you know, my understanding is not. I'm not intellectual about it, and I'm not. You know, it's 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 just from having it around for years and yeah. starting to see what things do. And same with drums. You you know, you know what a a, a Ludwig 400 sounds like, because, right. and 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 then you get a great drum. You, you know, you just know because you've you've played them. You know. It's, yeah. Yep. It's, that's all it is. Yeah. yeah. No, I, I exactly. I, I'm, and I, I, I was just going to say that I've. It's funny how I worked for a symbol company for all those years, but um, I feel like my my palette has been uh, widened in the last eight years since I've not worked at Zildjian. And it with it's no no offense to Zildjian, but I think just personally, I've when I got back into playing again, and I just opened my sort of mind and ears to everything. Right? I mean, that's yeah. that's. It, where it probably wasn't really open before fully. I'd, I'd go and I'd, I'd, I'd go to a trade show. I'd, um, I'd go see a drummer play and I'd, I'd play their cymbals and I'd appreciate what they were if they weren't what I was used to hearing at Zildjian. But, but now I'm, it's, you know, I'll go into a, you know, pro drum shop or, or Shane's place up in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, and I'll just go to every cymbal there's that's there. And I'll just appreciate all these different sounds and not, 
pay attention to what they say. It's well, well that's the, the way I, I've just been for a yeah. long, you know, for a long time. Not because, yeah. just because I've, <clears throat> I just don't think of it in those terms. And and the reason I discovered Istanbul Agops the first time was at Pro Drum, is I saw a thirtieth anniversary and I thought it was a K, and normally, as you probably know, Jerry and Stan put the old case out the back. <laughs> if they've got a really good set of it, they put them out the back and I go in and go, I get on the old case. And, oh, we've got a couple at the back. <laughs> you know, they, they don't want them out, which I understand. But they, yeah. they were out and I was like, oh, well, they've left a couple out. And I played them. I was like, hey, what's, what's this? And they went, oh, that's not K, okay. that's a 30th anniversary. And I was like, wow, oh, okay, who's doing this? And that's how it started. Yeah, um, yeah. So, but then you know i i'll still go into a shop and if i find a peisty or a you know i mean it can be a ufip you know as far as i'm concerned or a zilco or even you know i've i've been to you know a couple of the symbols i have in la that i use on studio sessions are symbols I, one of them's an astro symbol it's the wow. worst sounding symbol i've ever heard it records amazingly it's like the darkest trashiest thing and I just use it as a crash, and it's just amazing. It's just got yeah. a, it's a character of its own, and I've used them, used it a lot. And there you go. So, no, I, you know, I'm on the hunt for those all the time, Jeremy. I honestly, like, I'm I'm always looking for those oddball. I've 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 got a Zen twenty inch right now. That's um, um, I think it's a five star. It's the, it's the sort of higher quality Zen that that Fantastic. it's Fantastic. yeah, and it sounds it sounds good i mean it's it it sounds like a like an old a that's got some weird tones to it um they're very like old a. in fact yeah <clears throat> when i was doing a studio <clears throat> session in la um ryan adams um i did he had a kit in his studio and i was playing his hats and i was like man what are these hats they're amazing you know tried to buy them off him wasn't interested <laughs> five, uh, five star Five star Zucrazins, they weren't Zilzins. Oh, yeah. And I yeah. one of the best set of hi hats I've I've probably heard. Yeah. Really thin, probably, right? Really light recorded Quite well. Thin, but you know, that's another thing I've got about symbols, which uh, you know, I have a set of K's um that are the closest I've ever heard to Steve Gadd's that I happened to buy in um from a guy off e on eBay, but I I I bought them from uh, What's that place uh, south of Boston? Um, uh, I can't think of the name of the place. It's a very famous place. Uh, in, in Massachusetts? Is it? Yeah. Um, uh, Maine, not, uh, place, if you go south, if you were going by heading back to New York. Um, anyway, so he turned up at the hotel room with this set of Ks, but I flipped them because I know that Steve played the heavy one on the top. And right. as soon as I heard it, I went, this is the sound. And this, everybody, all the guys in London have heard this set of hi-hats I've got, and they just ask, where did you get them? And I, it was just lucky. And Paul um, at Zildjian found, found, had Steve's top hi-hat, the one that he used, and it was two grams difference, but exactly the same period, and it was two grams difference, minus yeah. two grams heavier. And so... Go. Yeah, it, it, and it's, that's what I'm saying. It's, and I knew because of the way that the I know this is super boring, but it's like the way that it, the way the stick reacts is it it ha, it doesn't have that thing with light case where they break up. It's yeah. got a very clean tick tick sound because it's heavy. It's like a bottom hi hat, but that's yeah. what's on the top, and that's what I I actually do for all hi hats. Anyway, enough. enough about that, that. But that's a good description because, like you say, thinner whether they're K's or anything thinner, hi-hats will have that sort of um, less solid, like you say, broken kind of sound. Yeah. And, uh, whereas like a, a little bit more meat can make all the difference in terms of like a, you know, a more solid note, so to well, speak. It's like the Tony and Elvin Wright, uh, and even the Steve Gadd, the 16 that he used. Have you ever heard that symbol? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's super yeah. heavy. It's yeah. not, it, yeah. everybody thinks that those... Those symbols. I mean, t there's no way those guys could have played them for very long if they'd been thin. Right. I mean, the, you know, none of those guys 
I mean, they all had super dynamics, but they all really hit hit the cymbals. Yeah. They would, they, I mean, they didn't last, but they wouldn't have lasted at all. You know, anyway. Yeah. I was just going to say, when we were talking about Zinn, the one that I have, I bought to replace. I had I had found one through Steve Maxwell's drum shop some years ago, and I had it at home. And I went to see uh, Ringo a few years ago, and I brought it uh, to the gig because, you know, of course, Ringo famously played Zinn cymbals and early on and and gave it to Ringo and he didn't have a recollection of of playing Zen which was kind of interesting he he um I, it was only later I think when when Gary Astridge who's you know I don't know if you know Gary he's documented all of Ringo's gear and he's like he's really the authority on 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 all of Ringo's gear and he when he saw Ringo he said oh yeah you 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 played one of you know played some of these in the old days and um so it's it's yeah there's some there's some gems out there of, of I've got a set of hi-hats on the on the Heyman kit that are these Italian um Cassian symbols I don't know if you know those right. and they're I think it's an offshoot of UFIP what are they called again? What, Sorry. What uh Cassian Cassian oh no I don't know them. I don't know yeah them. no yeah they're they're uh, made in Italy and they're they're like lighter new beats you know lighter but they have this kind of warmth but also like a sparkle they're they're really unique they're pretty cool oh, wow. yeah oh, i have to i have to check those out i've uh, yeah. i mean i don't <laughs> i don't need to check anything out i mean I, i've still got cymbals and drums that i've never played you know i mean it's it's a you know maybe it's a sickness i don't know i just <laughs> no. I, I, it's you know what while i can do it it's fun i mean i i am now trying to i am talking about selling stuff for just for the reason of the amount of stuff that I'm storing, and uh, it's a it's a ball and chain. But the great thing is I've now got it much more organised. I had a point where I had so much stuff I couldn't even get to things, you know. And it was it would be be just a mountain of drums in one room, and I just go, I want that kit at the back, and there's yeah. no way <laughs> I'm going to get to it. Yeah, yeah. Because I have a peacock flame as well. Because I know you got a peacock flame, Gretch. I do, and I I think I saw that peacock flame Man, kit. I yeah, love that, I love that finish. But yeah. I've also got moon glow. I've got moon glow flame now. Do you know oh, that one? I do, and that's really rare. That's a yeah. hard one to find. Well, I've been really like I got. I, it's two twenty inch. I got two kits, two twenty inch bass drums, but I got the 12, 13, 14, 16. I'd love to get a 22 and I'd also love to get an 18, but, but the moon glow, I love the moon glow flame. It's really, you know, that's a sweet. really cool finish. And that is that a, that's a round badge probably, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's sounds a incredible. Badge. Amazing sounding kit. Yeah. And the peacock is, is stop sign probably, right? Like mine. Stop sign. Yeah. All my, all yeah. my peacocks uh, is stop sign. Even though I did see, I did see an actual original, peacock round badge once in a place it was uh, rup strums in in denver years ago and i almost i thought about it and then i was just like no this is uh, crazy yeah that's that's a rare bird because yeah. um at, as we learn more about the badges you know by the time they got to the the um a lot of that stuff wasn't done during the stops during the round badge period it was done in the stop sign badge period but uh, but you've uh, you've probably You've probably seen this. I've I've had this a couple of years now. This is one of the original wow. twenty-four karat gold plated. Wow. Yeah. It's I, I and I know you'll appreciate this, Jeremy. I I had dreamed of owning one of these since I was like fourteen and I'd seen it in a Gretsch catalog and um yeah. So it's That's a that's a whole house. Isn't it? <laughs> it, it, it could be. It, it could. <laughs> um, I, somebody just asked Bill Fleming, our friend, asked if Tony played his high, if he flipped his high hats or played two bottoms. And I, I think he played two end, bottoms. I think he, played he played two played bottoms. bottoms. I think he did. That's correct. Yeah. Um, and it's interesting, isn't it? Because people, um, I, for years, I, I used to, and, and it's funny, you go go to a shop and the, the light Ks are the ones that are expensive and the heavy ones aren't, but the heavy ones are the ones. And I actually, you know what? This is when I first met Tane was um, when we did, we did a Jason Rebello record and I produced and he played on it, but I played one track and I borrowed, 
I I got Zildjian to send me some symbols to the session, and he said, "Oh, what did you get those for? You can you can use you can use mine." I was like, "Really? Wow!" And I played <laughs> Tanes. I, I mean, it's just yeah, uh, yeah, incredible. But they were he- I immediately was like, "Oh, they, these are these are heavier case than the ones that I use," which then made me think. And they were great. They were fantastic symbols. Mm. And uh, so, yeah, that was a, that yeah. was a amazing, it's great to, amazing moment. <laughs> it's great to pick your brain about all this gear, you know, and I, I appreciate that you're, um, I didn't want to spend the whole time talking about it. I, no, I, I know. Did, that's fine. I, yeah, no, and I, I wanted to ask you just to, to jump back a second. Um, I don't want to miss any, miss any of these questions or comments, some, some, some great comments here. Um, Playing with King Crimson, and I, I said it like when I before I introduced you that I that I, um, you know I wouldn't have I, I wouldn't have pegged you as as a um, you know as a guy that would come in as as the drummer for as a drummer for King Crimson, but you but you fit perfectly and and knowing more about your background because I I thought of you really more as like a a rock pop you know Cheryl's drummer for all those years and and you know, those rock records and rock bands you played in, but you, obviously you, you feel really comfortable in that role and, and you're playing a lot of keyboards too in King Crimson. Yeah. And I didn't realize you had such an, ex- I, I knew you played a little bit, but I didn't realize you had such an extensive background in playing keyboards too. So I, I, I don't, <laughs> this is the thing. Um, I, 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 mean, it was the, I did study piano for a couple of years when I was young, when I was six. Uh, and yeah. then I, I just messed around with it. And I did play, play keyboards in a couple of bands when I was young. And that was it. And I played on records. I played quite a bit of keyboards on one of Cheryl's records. Um, um, because I just had ideas. And I was like, OK. And I'd always had a few synths and a few old keyboards as well. Um, so I knew, you know, knew how to you know set you know like a mini moog up and get a sound and, and whatever but mm. um i've never it's the first proper keyboard gig i've ever done is wow. keyboard because i've never been I, I, and i've done stuff myself on you know my you know if i produce records i often played the keyboards just because i knew what i wanted or if it was something that i couldn't play i'd get jason rebello in or somebody to <laughs> you know who could play something that was complicated but um but the reason I got the gig that I was asked at all was because Gavin had remembered. I met Gavin when I was 17 or 18 because I'd, <laughs> bizarrely, I was, I was quite ill as a child and I used to transcribe piano things when I was young. And I transcribed The Black Page by Frank Zappa no when kidding. I was 16 or 17. I don't know what I got into it and I just, and I didn't, I wasn't educated, so I, I didn't understand quintuplets or anything like that, which I know what they are now. But um, I'd go, well, there's 20 notes in a bar of 4-4. Four, four. So that's that's got to be five five groups of four, you know. So yeah. then I and then I started to understand. So I just I was slowing it down, slowing the record down. I transcribed it. Then somebody told me, oh, there's this drummer in uh, London, Gavin Harrison, he's um, he's got the score of the Black Page. Uh, somebody had bought it from as a present, I think. So, and they put me in touch with him, and I called him, and he said, "Yeah, come rounds." And I wrote my chart out, and I he had the original chart, and I checked it, and I got it right, amazingly. But um, wow. I just wanted to make sure that I got it right, and that was that was how we met, and he remembered that, and. Um, because I always said to, I mean, I said to Gavin when he, I said, why don't you get Gary Husband? <laughs> I mean, that guy, like, <laughs> he's, the, you know, he's one of the best drummers and best, you know, keyboard oh. players you could ever, you know, and I, I, I was very lucky to grow up and, you know, go to the 606 and hang with Gary many nights yeah. and even get to play with him. And, you know, I mean, that guy's on another, on another level, but that, yeah, I was surprised to get called to do the gig, but then the keyboards were very simple that Bill Rieflin, uh, my late dear friend, Bill Rieflin, yeah. um, who, uh, it was just, he was just playing the pads and the very simple parts. And a lot of the keyboard parts were missing from King Crimson. And then uh, 
when I got the gig, I learned those parts and uh, Robert caught me playing piano in a dressing room. There was a dressing room which had an acoustic piano and I was just messing around. I was playing, I don't know, I was playing some Bill Evans thing that I transcribed years ago and I was just trying to remember it. And, and he came and said, what's that? I went, oh, I'm just messing around with this Bill Evans thing that I used to. And he went, play something like that tonight between this song and that song on your own. I was like, <laughs> okay. Wow. Okay. <laughs> and suddenly, you know, this is the thing. Here I am playing a solo piano thing in front of three and a half thousand people or however many it was out the blue. And um, and then it, it became a fixture. Do it every night. Do an improvisation every night. So I started doing improvisations, pro, you know, trying to really not learn prepare anything and just jump in and see what happened. And then he said, oh, great. Well, you can play all this other stuff that we don't play anymore. Um, because we've never had a piano player in the band. Now I'm playing all this stuff. Yeah. Uh, so the gig was like 20% keyboards, 80% drums, and now it's 50-50, you know. So that's what it's, happened. Yeah, I mean, it's but it's probably pretty refreshing, right? I mean, it's... it's Yeah. Oh, yeah, it's I mean, to, to be... To, yeah. And so, so I mean, do you... Oh, sorry, go ahead. No, I just say, yeah, no, it's a, it's a great thing to be doing. It's mad. I mean, sometimes I just can't believe it. And sometimes I have, you know, I've had a couple of freeze moments where I, it's suddenly I'm aware that I'm doing this crazy thing because you're not really aware of an audience when you work, you know, when you're doing the gig, you're just, yeah. you're just concentrating on doing the gig. But um, yeah, I just uh, have the odd, I've had the odd moment where I've just gone, I'm playing piano in front of all these people. It's like, <laughs> I can, and then I, can, I look and I just go, I don't even know what this thing is in front of me. You know, it's just complete yeah. freeze, freak out. But uh, it's only happened a couple of times, thank goodness. But uh, And you're playing piano oh. in King Crimson too. It's not It's not like it's, uh, <laughs> you know, a, a bunch of mates at the pub. It's like, you know, it's like a really... It's, it, it's interesting though, because of my jazz background, which, you know, was the thing. I mean, as I say, it's so, it's so funny. I remember when I was a jazz if if I ever was a jazz player, um, that a member of a quite famous rock drummer who I won't mention had said to somebody, "Oh yeah, Jeremy's a good jazz drummer. But he he's he you can tell he's never played rock. You know, he can't play rock and roll at all." And yet, most people's perception of me is as a, as a rock drummer. Yeah, which is just which is just a funny thing because that's yeah. what I think I became. A little bit more known when I started playing with Cheryl and the rest of it and that. So my earlier years, which was all jazz, no, hardly any rock at all, um, has just gone. But it's that's what I think enabled me to do the King Crimson gig. And what's interesting, the King Crimson gig is not like a jazz gig because what I always say is, it's like a classical gig. You learn the parts, and that's it. There's no improvise. Well very very minimal improvising and yeah. I think that that's the difficult thing I mean that's the thing about jazz is when you're playing an odd time signature in jazz you're not playing a pattern you're playing in seven eight or you're playing in 15 16 or whatever it is and you understand and then everybody else in the band is also improvising so you've got to know what 15 16 feels like you can't just have your pattern that you stick with and hope for, and hang on for dear life and, and that's the difference is with, with King Crimson, it's not an improvised, for, in my experience so far, it has, it's not, it's, 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 you know, you learn it and you do it. So as difficult as it might sound, it, I don't think it is as difficult as playing maybe, let's say, a jazz thing where you're, you know, when I'm playing with Jason and he's dissecting the beat in a certain way and I might not even understand, you know, he'll suddenly do something and I don't know what it is. And you've just got to, react but also sort of know where you are so it's, yeah, it's a different yeah. thing so I think I was lucky I had that as a background because in a way that music is I think that music is harder yeah yeah For and, and with is. with King Crimson are you um do you spend I had two questions do you spend much time at home working on on playing keyboards or do you to keep it fresh do you just is it almost better to just you know, have your chops there, but just not go into it with any sort of structure. I have to learn. 
I have to learn stuff now because I'm actually now playing all my parts and Bill Reeflin's parts because I had to develop a whole, uh, basically I did all the other parts that weren't being played. And then mm. Bill was unable to do the last tour because he was too ill. And then, um, and we were gonna get somebody else in, we tried it and it didn't work. So I turned around to Robert and said, look, I think I can actually, if I use bass pedals, I, you know, most of it's one hand and, you know, my parts are one hand, Bill's parts are one hand. I think I, I can probably play both parts and that's what I'm doing now. So wow. I'm playing both evil parts and that, you know, most of it is covered. And yeah. it's just more like what a normal problem keyboard player would do. Whereas um, before it was just very sort of simple. And it's, it, it, I've made it more difficult for myself. So I have to practice. Yeah, and I've got my keyboards here now. I am now practicing because we haven't played for two years. And, you know, six days rehearsal, which we, is what we're going to do as a band, is not going to be enough if I'm not prepared. So I, I just got to do the work. And yeah. I had to do that when I joined King Crimson. There was no, you know, I had to get together with Gavin and learn the drum parts because it's, you know, it's 12 minute long songs with, many yeah. tempo changes and it's all like overdubs it's like playing a tom-tom part here then a hi-hat part here then you get to play the groove for four bars and then you stop and then you're just playing a cymbal thing and it's it's a piece that you learn from start to finish so i just have to re-remember it and then once i remember it that's that's pretty much it you know yeah so, so and that and that was my other question so you you're you're, you're learning these parts by memory, um, you're not relying on on charts. You're not you're not, or you probably have some of it written out just as a reference, or or is it all just? I have everything. I wrote everything out to start with, or I had somebody help me write it all out because there was no way. The first rehearsal, I had to I had 23 tunes to play. You know, yeah. and walking into a room with Robert Fripp and Tony Levin and Gavin Harrison and, and Mel Collins and Jacko, you know who've been doing it for three years with Bill, you know, I yeah. could, I knew that I wasn't going to be able to get away with walking and going, uh, oh, how does this one go? <laughs> <It> was, <yeah. laughs> I, had to, I, had to, I had to learn it. And it was, you know, it was a lot. It was a lot. Yeah. It was a great, oh, a great thing, great experience. I mean, how, how often do you get an experience like that where you've, you know that in two weeks time, you're going to be playing in front of an audience and you, you've got to, you've got to do it. It's, it's yeah. a great it's in it's a it's a great thing to be put in that position and i knew i could i mean if i had thought i can't do this i would have said no but i knew i had to work you know i knew i had to do the work and i think that's the same even when you're doing a pop you've got to do the work if you if you've got the work done then everything else is just tweaking you know and specifics of how people want things and Mm. I've just seen Bill Fleming's asked a question. Sorry, I'm looking at the feed. Oh, okay. Sorry. Uh, yeah, no, that's okay. I uh, have to ask about his uh, Steely Den cover band is what Bill asked. Oh, yeah. Do you want to talk about that in a second? Yeah, let's, let's hear. Oh, let's, well, let's... yeah. I had to do it because I've been, it's one of the bands that I've been the biggest fan of all my life. And uh, I, uh, I know, I know John, Harrington and, and Jim Beard, because I played with Madeline Peru just before I just started the Noel Gallagher gig. I got called to do that for three months because the drummer, Darren Beckett, who's a great um, drummer, who was in New York, but he's now back in England, was, um, uh, he had another, another gig. And I'd already, Jason had already played with Madeline Peru and I really liked, I thought she was great. And so, mm. I did it and it was fantastic. But John and, and Jim were not doing the gig because it was two other guys who were great, made a great band, had a fantastic time. Um, but I, I'd also met Keith through, uh, because I'd constantly gone down and watched the, the Wayne Krantz gig, which I ended up get, you know playing a few, yeah. fortunately a few times. Um, and I, in fact, the first person to, uh, introduced me to Keith with Jeff Watts when we were doing that session in 1999. And we, I went, so you've got to check this guy out. And uh, it was, it was Keith, it was amazing. Yeah. So anyway, sorry, I'm darting off as usual. No, so, no, yeah, um, Keith, yeah. I, 
Well, I, I know that Keith will never not do that gig. So I just went, well, if I'm never going to get to play with that band, I'm just going to do my own thing. And And it was in the back of my mind. I never thought about it too you know i thought about it a lot but i never got it together and finally i was doing a gig with a friend of mine and we happened to play a steely dan tune on the gig and afterwards this friend of mine said why don't we do this and my brother was on the gig as well and we went okay we'll do it we started the band with just the three of us we had one rehearsal and this particular guy didn't realize how detailed i wanted to do it because i wanted it to do it to the letter because I just thought if an audience comes along and sees a tribute band, they want to see it exact. They don't want to yeah. see your vote. Is, uh, and I mean, I'm talking, I've learned Steve Solo on Asia, which is a hell of a difficult, for me, a difficult thing to do, to play somebody else's. So, but that was a decision I made. And, um, and when we first did it, believe it or not, Pino Palladino played bass with us because I was already wow. doing another band with him. So he did the very first gig we did, and then he moved to LA. So um, we had to unfortunately get somebody else. But I say unfortunately, we actually got somebody who's incredibly great. So it, it's it's all fine. Everybody's cool, and we started doing it. It's a fourteen-piece band, and uh, it's one. It's up there as some of the best fun I've ever had. Because wow, how can how can it how can it not be playing that those tunes? I mean, absolutely. Yeah. But, yeah, and, that, and that's what it made me realize is that I've always sort of thought about the tribute thing in a certain way, but actually, what's what's better than playing your favorite music? There is there, there isn't anything better, actually. Yeah. So, exactly. um, and and I think again, if you do the work and you you re for me check out you know it's like I'm doing a rock band thing at the moment, and I had to play Start Me Up the other day, and <laughs> what a I mean, so difficult to copy Charlie. I mean, just yeah. so much more difficult in a way than somebody who plays like a metronome. It's just it, to get the nuances. I, well, I don't think it's possible, but to, it doesn't sound right if you don't try, at least try and get the nuance of the way that he plays it. So that, I'll just say not to get off. You know, you know me, I could go off on a Charlie tangent forever, but that's a song that... I played that in a cover band 30 something years ago and I was a massive Charlie fan at the time. I still am, of course. Yeah. And I could never play that song. Forget the intro part that, that weird <laughs> but yeah, upside down thing that he does, but uh, just playing the, <clears throat> yeah, playing the groove. It's just and four on the floor. It's four yeah, on the floor as well. That's right. Yeah. It's just so, and it, but, but the thing is, it's just that thing of, it's just the way that he's broken up and it, he just he's he's never sort of laying it down but it's it just drives forward it's very it's very interesting and it's the combat for me it's the combination of the way where keith places the beat and where where charlie places the beat that just makes it work in this incredible way yeah. and yet maybe in a sort of if you wanted to analyze it on a sort of grid you might go oh okay <laughs> but, uh, yeah it's uh just which just proves to me that you know it's not all about that stuff playing yeah. perfectly i mean it's not is I, it's something i was very interested in when i was younger but i've i've lot i've got less interest in this sort of perfect time thing i, I just think all my favorite drummers have just got their own you know it, it, yeah it's uh yeah personality uh, yeah. is what i like that's what I like. And and that, that that song is a great example of that too. That that interaction between Charlie and Keith and yeah, if you put it on a grid, it's it's not going to be Jeff Beccaro. Well, you know, even Jeff Beccaro. I mean, I'm not. People say about perfect time. If you, do, it's you know, I mean, this might be sacrilege to say this, but if you, I mean, even if you listen to Rosanna, the 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 bit there's a bit that slows down. But yeah. it's perfect for the song. I mean, and he he, yeah. he actually said in an interview that he hated playing with the click. And I I sort of know what he means is that there is something more, there's just some more more humanity without it for me. Because who's to say the click's right? I mean, the click is, 
It's just this robot, you know, okay, play with yeah. him. It can, it can be great. I know a lot of people love playing with the click and some people make it work perfectly. And I've had to do it for years. I, mean, I did it for years. But there's something also really great about not having it there and just see where it goes. And, yeah, yeah. yeah. Our friend, our friend Andy Newmark, when, you oh. know, yeah, you only need to my, my spend hero. five... Uh, yeah, me too. Me too. And boy, you, you get him started on, on the click and he'll just, you know, I, 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 I just love him to pieces and that, you know, he'll, he'll, it's the worst fucking thing they ever invented, you know, and it, uh, enough Jordan, of this. Steve Jordan's been saying stuff about that as well recently. I noticed, I saw an interview where he was going off about the perfect thing. And it's interesting because I, yeah. and I, I'm, 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 I, I think again, it depends on the music. It really, do, I, I'm not one, I, I don't want to get fixed and say it's this or it's that, but there yeah. is, you know, even in King Crimson, there's things, you know, with Bill who, Bruford, who I, you know, I absolutely love where things just uh, like verses are like four PPM faster. And because we don't do that, it, it actually doesn't, it just, the song feels different. Mm -hmm. It's in time, sure, but it doesn't quite have the emotional, you know, so we've actually incorporated some of those things where we go up a bit. Yeah. And I think it improves. I think it's better, you know, but uh, that's, that's me. That's my taste. I mean, I, you know, everybody's got to do their own thing and do it the way they want it. But uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, Jeremy, we're, we're at, I, 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 I apologize to you and to everybody for the, the snags that we had technically today that, has never happened, and um, <laughs> I don't know. Let's but I'm hope, glad let's we. Hope it, let's hope it never happens again, John. <laughs> let's hope it never happens again. I think it was kind of it made it made it fun and interesting. We didn't lose lose the connection, so we we didn't lose the the uh, the Facebook connection anyway. But but I I, I want to thank you so much for doing this, and I know you've got oh. shot number two coming up next week. Is that true? I have. Yeah, yeah. I've got shot number two coming up. Um. So, yeah, that's all good, which good. means, again, I can, you know, as far as traveling uh, mid-July, I'll be sort of a good month with, you know, six, well, five weeks, I'll have had it. So I think that's uh, hopefully make any audiences feel, say, well, we'll all have had it by then. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so. yeah that's good. And Adam Parsons. If... if uh, if you're around, will be great. It'd be great to see if we get if we do manage to get over and do this. Uh, yeah, uh, I I would love to, and, and well, I'll I'll stay in touch with you, and um, when I see if there's a date listed, I'll I'll reach out to you and Gavin and and Pat too. Pat's an old Pat Mustelato's an old friend too from from when I worked at Simmons and great Pat. guy, great drummer. Well, yeah, the, yeah Pat. <laughs> yeah, he's it's, it's so great. <laughs> yeah, I love. Pat. I don't. Yeah. I just don't know how he does what he does. It's unbelievable. He's unbelievable. He's he's something. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, this has been so great, Jeremy. I I I, I thank you so much for doing it. Um, I want to thank everybody for watching. Everybody, please give a big hand at home oh. for Jeremy Stacy. Oh, thank you. Well, honored to be on here. Thank you, John. Oh, my really pleasure. And, yeah. Uh, no, it's it's you're you're. The toppest of top chaps, as we say, as, as our friend Dave Maddox says. Oh, well, thank you. Ah, uh, well. Right. All right, well, we'll sit tight. I'll, I'll end the live stream, and then we'll we'll say goodbye yeah. in our little uh, private Zoom room. But um, great. I'll wait. Till, yeah, I'll wait. I'll wait here. All right. Great. Thanks, everyone, for checking in. Great to see everyone. Speak, speak to everyone. See everybody's comments. Thank you. Yeah, great. Thanks, Jeremy. Thanks, everybody. Um, see you soon. Definitely on June the 8th with Don Lombardi. But if um, maybe even before then, who knows? Who knows? All right. Over and out. Thanks, everybody.